Hey, DCF, Pastor Brad here. Hope you had a great weekend and hope you're having a great start to another week as we seek to pursue Christ together throughout our week and um, intentionally take time during each day, either morning or afternoon or, or evening, to spend time with God and His Word, listening to His voice speak to us, and then continuing that conversation, speaking back to God through prayer, expressing our heart's desires, expressing our concerns, our fears, our dreams, our, our desires, Lord, bringing whatever is upon our heart to the Lord. Because as we heard yesterday in that sermon, God is imminent. He is intimately involved in this world and in our lives. He He cares deeply about us. And that, that's a picture of, of the gospel and, and what Jesus Christ did in, in becoming like us, taking on human flesh and blood, entering our world and our experience so that he might redeem us and save us um, and restore us to himself. And so we do that and we encourage each other to do that throughout the week. And, and let's just be honest, we all need encouragement to keep on doing that because um, our sin natures are waging war against us, telling us sleep is way better than time with the Lord. Um, lunch plans are, are way better than time with the Lord. Watching TV or, or getting to bed earlier is, is better than time with the Lord. And all those things are, are good and not necessarily bad on their own, but um, there's always a reason to not spend time with the Lord. And so we want to be intentional in encouraging one another to do that. Um, just a thought as, as you spend time in Scripture um, this week, you know, there's different approaches to it. And, and if you already have an approach that's working for you, great. I'm not suggesting in any way to do something different than that. But if you're looking for a thought, um, here, here is one. And that is to take, take it slow. Don't, don't try to cover a ton um, in, in a passage or in a day. Uh, take a passage, whether it's a paragraph, um, a chapter, and, and read, through, read through the section and then go back and read through one verse at a time. And, and what my encouragement would be is to get yourself some kind of study Bible. This is the, this is the one that I use. It's the, the Reformation Study Bible. It's an ESV Bible. Um, but there's there's great NIV study Bibles, other ESV study Bibles, um, because in the notes of that that study Bible, and that's a little bit different than an application Bible. An application Bible is maybe looking at like applying, but like a study Bible is going to get into a little bit in a in an abbreviated sense of kind of the things that I'm reading throughout the course of a week as I study a passage that that tries to give you as much insight into what is meant behind that passage. So, you know, half the page is, you can kind of see on here, half the page is the actual text, and then the bottom part of the page is notes on several of the verses. And if you take it slow, it, it allows you to kind of go down and, and see if there's if there's notes about that verse, and, and to consider uh, in a little bit deeper way, allowing your heart to meditate on that verse. What is God saying in this verse? What's he saying about himself? What's he saying about my life? What's he saying about the world around us? And then the other thought in taking in, if you're taking it slow, what that enables you to do is also look on the side, because on the side of, um, this is upside down, I know, but in the side, there's all these references here. And what those are, are there cross references to other verses that are similar, or possibly it's going to mention when an Old Testament passage is being quoted from the New Testament, or if it's an Old Testament passage where it's included in the New Testament. So it gives you all sorts of insights. Sometimes they're obvious and, and the way that they're written in the text indicates that it's a quotation from Scripture, but other times it's easy to kind of miss it. Um, and so if you look at that verse and you go, what are these other verses? And then you can turn to those and kind of check it out. So it's just a thought of taking it slow, trying to go deeper into a passage. Um, and it's not that's not always the best way. Sometimes reading lots of, and I'll encourage you in this way and at other times, read big chunks at one time so you get the full picture, especially of narrative passages of, of where it's going. But especially if you're in letters, Paul's letters or, or the other epistles in the New Testament, taking it really slow, I find to be helpful uh, in trying to really mine the, the nuggets of what God has for us in his word. Okay, so today we're wrapping up um, Article 34 of the Belgian Confession. This is the longest we've spent on any article, <laughs> four weeks. Um, as I look ahead to, to the Lord's Supper, we're probably going to do the same thing. I don't know if it'll be four weeks. We'll see when I start dividing it up next week. But 
Um, these are long ones, and, and, and for good reason. There's a lot to understand. There's a lot that's often misunderstood. Uh, and so, you know, the, the authors of the confessions were trying to make it clear what we believe, what we reject. Um, last, last week, there was the rejection of what the Anabaptists believe about uh, baptism. And so we're wrapping up part four today and thinking about children, right? This is the, this is the question that's kind of been sitting out there. I've kind of hinted at it a little bit. Um, I've had major movement in my life on this topic. Should kids be baptized? Um, and, 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 and the reason that this comes at the end of this article is because it's the application of the, um, it's the application of what we understand baptism to be, right? Um, we started in week one talking about how baptism has replaced circumcision as the sign of the new covenant. So the covenant sign switched after Christ shed his own blood to not be a blood sign, but to be a cleansing sign of water, right? From blood to water. Um, and so uh, let me read and then we'll discuss and I'll try to keep it in a reasonable time frame for us. All right. We believe our children ought to be baptized and sealed with the sign of the covenant. As little children were circumcised in Israel on the basis of the same promises made to our children. All right. So, I mean, we'll, we'll read the rest of it. That's really all you need right there to kind of construct a biblical theological explanation for why, um, for why we baptize babies. We baptize babies because in the Old Covenant with Abraham, the promises of what were signified in the, in the um, covenant were extended to believers and their children. And, and again, this is why it's critical to make a distinction between covenant, and I was listening to a sermon this week, covenant and election, covenant and salvation. Um, not everyone in the covenant is saved. We wish that was true. We wish everyone who joined the visible church um, was saved, and, and elders do our best to ensure that what is professed before the body of believers when someone joins is a genuine faith and trust in Christ. The reality is um, Judas was part of the 12. The reality is in the old covenant uh, of Israel, the prophets would cry out, you need to be circumcised in your heart. You have a physical circumcision, but that physical circumcision is worth nothing if there isn't an inward invisible circumcision of your heart, if there's not genuine faith and trust in Christ and the gospel. And so again, there's a distinction between being part of the covenant, the covenant, and I heard this explained this week, it was very helpful, the covenant is the means by which um, someone gets to the point of salvation, right? It's the, it's the vehicle by which people are uh, are in and move towards Christ, but it's not in an exact equivalent with salvation. And this is where it messes up people on both ends of the spectrum, especially people who have grown up with any kind of sort of Baptist belief, which um, I didn't grow up in a Baptist church, but this is the way I thought about it historically, is that there has to be genuine faith to be baptized. Now we are commanded, repent, believe, be baptized. We're going to read that in just a second. Um, so baptism is the appropriate response to someone who has faith. It marks you as a covenant member. However, just as in Old Testament Israel, covenant members also included the children because the promises of what were signified in the sign of baptism, the washing away of our sin, are extended to believers and to their offspring. It hasn't been obtained yet, right? Again, this is what we talked about a couple weeks ago, the difference between those who would believe that the putting of the water on you washes away your original sin. It's not what we're saying. Um, but it does mark you as being part of the covenant. So um, it says, 
as little children were circumcised in Israel on the basis of the same promises made to our children. Let me just read that language for you in Acts chapter 2. Well, uh, yeah, let me start in Genesis 17. I'm going to read Genesis 17 in Acts 2, just so you hear covenant language to believers and their children. All right, so God says to Abraham in Genesis 17, 9, and God said to Abraham, as for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your offspring after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your offspring after you. Every male among you shall be circumcised. You shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins, and it shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised. Every male throughout your generations, whether born in your house or bought with your money from any foreigner, uh, I just messed it up, who is not of your offspring, both he who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money shall surely be circumcised. So shall my covenant be in the flesh of your flesh and everlasting covenant. Any uncircumcised male who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin shall be cut off from his people. He has broken my covenant. Okay, so covenant sign given to believers who were born into Israel, who came into Israel from outside of Israel, believers and their children. Again, it doesn't mean that you are saved automatically. Um, who was circumcised? Ishmael, right? Ishmael wasn't of the promise. Isaac was, but Ishmael still was circumcised. He was part of the household of Abraham. Okay, now in Acts 2, listen to how similar this language is. So Paul in Acts 2, um, now when, this is verse 37, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized. Every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Um, and then there's more. Okay, so that you hear that same language of promise. The promise is extended to you and your children. Doesn't mean the children have received the Holy Spirit yet. The, the thing signified still has to be received by faith, which is why we encourage uh, teenagers as soon as they're ready or any adult as soon as they're ready to begin the process of making a public profession of their faith, claiming Jesus as their own, and therefore completing, sorry about that, completing their baptism. We use that language, completing their baptism. Because, again, the baptism doesn't save us. That's probably a sign I need to sign off here. Um, so I didn't read the rest of it, but let me, just, uh, let me just read the last paragraph. Furthermore, baptism does for our children what circumcision did for the Jewish people. That is why Paul calls baptism the circumcision of Christ. That's a quote from Colossians 2.11. Colossians 2, 11, 2, 12, that's the big verse that signifies the switching of the sign, the, the unity between circumcision and baptism, which I believe we talked about in week one of this whole series. So, okay, there we go. Um, you also have, uh, I can't resist, you also have um, household baptisms in the book of Acts. Uh, that's not necessarily a guaranteed proof, but it does indicate that uh, a parent believed and was baptized, and so was their whole household, which is an interesting way of saying that. Also, you would think if the whole church had operated in this way from Abraham on, that the, the covenant people were believers in their children, and all of a sudden in the new covenant, something radically different was the case, and only believers now were members of the covenant, and their children were not covenant members well, then you would think that the scriptures would explain that difference, would communicate that difference. And yet it just continues on. We just see the church continuing on because God is a covenantal God and operates in the same way yesterday, today and forever. His people have always been made up of believers and their children, the covenant community that is to live by faith 
and and encourage the profession of faith when um, when children become old enough to do so on their own. Okay, have a great week, loving and serving your King. See you on Sunday.